We have like 20 people online. Okay, fine. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This morning, I'll be leaving us topic the management of Nasolacrima dot obstruction. Uh, my name is Obim Bonchinezi and these are my contacts. I'll use this outline, the introduction, the epidemiology, the anatomy of the lacrimal apparatus, physiology of the lacrimal apparatus, the pathophysiology, the etiology, management which entails the history, the examination, investigation, differential treatment, and conclusion. Now, by way of introduction, the tear film is an important component for vision. Uh, we know that it contributes to the refractive index of the eye. It is produced by the lacrimal and the accessory lacrimal glands. Drainage of the tear film from the pontin to the is from the pontin to the inferior nerve meatus. Now, any blockage of the apparatus, the drainage apparatus at the level of nasolacrimal dot is known as nasolacrimal dot obstruction. Now, uh, epidemiology has been noted to increase with rising age, uh, particularly in the Western world, more in the in women. Um, uh, but, however, we realize that our experience in National Eye Center, the 10 year study which we did, we realize that it is more in use. Basically, excuse me, basically between ages uh, 21 to 30 years with a male preponderance. This may not be unconnected to the fact that most of them are traumatic and muscle lacrimal blood obstruction. It's also known to be seen in 5% of full-term infants, and uh, the etiology is actually known to be due to increased inflammation of the nasal mucosa, which that is why it's known. Now, this is our experience in National Eye Center. Uh, we realized that uh, about 50 of the patients we saw were between uh, 21 to 30 years, followed by the 31 to 40 years age group. So the middle age, which commonly is the working uh, population uh, in this country, is what was affected. Now, the anatomy of the lacrimal apparatus, we notice that uh, you will know that, that there is a secretory and a non-secretory part. The non-secretory part is also the drainage system. Now, the secretory part is the main Lacrima, the main and accessory lacrimal glands, all the glands are serous arsenide in nature, which means that their fluid is acetonic with plasma, and they have a central lumen which it oozes out. Now, the non secretory drainage system is made up of the lacrimal function, the lacrimal canaliculus, and common canaliculus, the lacrimal sac, and the nasal lacrimal dot. Now, um, the main lacrimal gland is located at the anterior part of the orbital roof. It is almond in shape. It has two parts, the orbital and the parfedral part. The dots are on the lateral part of the superior fornis, which are about 10 to 12, and the inferior fornis are about 1 to 2, which empty into the flow. The accessory lacrimal glands, the glands of cruise, which is beneath the papebral condentiva between the phonics, is located between the phonics and the edge of the passes. And we also open into the upper and inferior phonics. We also have the glands of warfarin, which is at the upper border of the tassel plate, superior tassel plate, which also opens into the Now, the nervous, the neurovascular supply of the Lacrimal uh, apparatus is from the lacrimal artery, which is a branch of the ophthalmic artery. The nervous supply is divided into the into three parts. We have the sensory part, which is the, from the lacrimal nerve, a division of from the ophthalmic division of prayer nerve five, and then the sympathetic plexus, which runs with the carotid plexus down to the lacrimal gland after 
not a maximum, the CIA is going on. And then there's a creature multiplied by switches from the superior salivary nucleus. Now, the drainage system of the lacrimal gland is made up of a pontum, a, a pontum, the ampullae, the canonicoli, which is superior and inferior, and then the common canoniculus, and then the lacrima sac, the nasal lacrima buds, and then the inferior meatus of the menstrual. Now, the drainage system is uh, the pontum is represented by B in this picture, it's temporal, about six millimeter temporal to the medial canthus. We have the superior uh, and inferior. Uh, we have the canaliculi. So we have the canaliculi, the superior and the inferior. And then the part of the canaliculi is made up of the vertical parts. The vertical part, which is also the also known as the ampulla, which is about two mm, and then the horizontal part, which is eight m, as depicted in the picture. Now they both canaliculi join to form the common canaliculus, which is somewhere here in this picture, and which enters into the lacrima sac. Now there is a gate valve, which is the valve or semilunar preventing the contents of the common canaliculus of the sac from entering into the common canaliculus once tear, is, tear drainage has started. Now the lacrimal sac is uh, 10 millimeters in length. It is this part, the, and then it is located within the lacrimal fossa, which is made up of the lacrimal bone and the frontal process of the massiva in the anterior part of the medial orbital worm. It is, uh, when distended, it measures about 15 to by 6 mm, which is about two to three times the size of this normal size. Now, the fundus, it has a fundus, the body and the neck, which is continuous with the muscle dot. It is lined by non-keratinized squamous cell epithelium. Now, the lacrimal dots, which is the continuation of the sac from the fundus down to the inferior meatus, is located within a bony wall. Now, it, is, it measures about 12 to 18 millimeter in length and 3 mm in diameter. The landmark is from the inner cantus, the medial cantus, the line from the medial cantus to The ally of the from the nostrils. The main and accessory glands secret tears. Queen's evaporation will depend on the blink rate of the eye, the ambient temperature of the environment, and then the size of the palpebral fissure. Now, with each blink, um, the drainage uh, network or mechanism is set up, and it about through the quantum of the uh, of the of the of the drainage system. Now, superiorly, about 30% of tear film is drained, and then inferiorly, 70% is drained via suction and capillary action. It's also noted that gravity also aids in this action as well. Now, with that, uh, as there is a compression with a blink reflex, uh, sorry. With a blink reflex, the ampullae is compressed by the pretarsal of the glaris of the ampullae. And then there's a medial movement of the pontum, and then which causes the shortening of the horizontal uh, canaliculum, which is represented in the, this diagram. And subsequently, tear film is drained into the uh, sac. And then the compression of the the compression of the sac by the of, of the glaris muscle creates a negative pressure, which sucks up the tears into the sac. And then, as the eyes are opened, that positive pressure is further uh, created, which forces the tear film down into the nasolacrima dot, which is in this phase now. This is the distension of the sac, and then it draws it up to 
to the um, Nasola Crema, but it drains down to the inferior turbulence. Now, the pathophysiology, any obstruction of the dots as represented here in this picture beside at the at the level of the just before the opening of at the inferior meatus, and it's been known that the current inflammation with edema and hypertrophy of the tissues have been indicated. Also, bony fractures of the turbulence are also being proposed. Now, etiology, you have congenital and uh, acquired. Mostly, the etiology for the congenital is believed to be an imperforate membrane at the valve of pesne. And like I said earlier, it affects about 5 to 6% of stem infants. Uh, acquired etiology, trauma has been significantly implicated in our environment, as evidenced by the work which we did, which I will share with us soon. Now, the sinus diseases and damage from which can during maxillary and surgery cannot, has also been implicated. Now, inflammatory diseases like, like psychosis, uh, granulomatous disease with angiitis, lacrima, plux has also been implemented. Plugs that are dislodged from the pontum or canalicular tend to occlude the dots when they congregate together. Neoplasms, when one notices a bloody discharge from the sac, from the pontum with distension of the sac above the medial canton tendon, that helps, uh, that makes one to wonder the presence of neoplasms. Now, evolutional ptosis um, is, has, the etiology is actually unknown, but it affects women more, two times more in women than men. And then there is a compression of the lumen by inflammatory infiltrates. Now, jacrolyte casts. Jacrolyte uh, casts, uh, <coughs> jacrolyte casts is also known to affect the, uh, the dots. Now, like I said earlier, etiology, we, the National Eye Center, over a 10 year period, we found out that. that uh, Traumatic nasolacrimal dot obstruction accounted for 39% 39 of the patients we saw. And then um, chronic, uh, followed by chronic dacrocystitis and nasolacrimal and congenital nasolacrimal dot obstruction. Why the primary acquired dot obstruction accounted for only 3% of the cases. Now, in managing these patients, uh, you one has to look at the history. Um, and in looking at the history, you need to know what when was the time of onset. Was it does, does it look like congenital or acquired? And if it is acquired, uh, is it, was there a history of trauma, head or facial trauma? Uh, were there nasal injuries? Were there recurrent sinus infection and etc. Now, the symptoms usually they present with epiphora, with matted knees and lashes, as seen in this picture. Now, there is usually recurrent infection, which, which is usually multiparalent in nature. And then, bloody discharge, you, one has to suspect uh, malignancy. There is crossing of the eyelids, which is seen in this patient as well. Now, for in National Eye Center, we also realized that epiphora was in 36% of the patients we present that came to National Eye Center over the 10 year period, uh, followed by uh, people who had frontal discharge. And then significantly, 12% uh, of the patients had nasal symptoms. So it's always imperative to ask for nasal symptoms in these patients. Uh, Roplas was also positive in about 1% of patients. Now, the signs, like I said earlier, you could see swelling beside the nose, uh, which can be erythematous uh, if, if infected, and sometimes painful if, there is, if it is uh, acute dacrocystitis. And then sometimes blood vision can be present when you have a clogging of the vision by excessive tearing. Now, Roplas, which is the presentation of the contents of the lacrimal sac, usually positive. In our case, we saw about 31% of the patients had blood plus positive. Now, physical examination, 
one has to look at the general physical examination, particularly paying attention to the face. And then looking if there is an obvious asymmetry, if there are scars before now, so that you know that probably there is a, there has been an affectation of the face, particularly around the nasal region. Now, the unaided and best corrected visual acuity, if need be, the unaided is actually a prerequisite, but best corrected if need be if the patient. And then in ocular examination, one looks at the leads. Is usually matted. And you also look at the cornea to find out the presence of defective ulcers. Examination of the nostrils and for patients presenting or 12% of the patients who presented to have us had nasal symptoms. So it's all behoves on us to look at the nostrils in order to ensure that the patient has a holistic examination. Now differentials of this is a congenital glaucoma. You have the bacterial carotid conjunctivitis, tracheasis, entropion, sometimes pontal atresias, and then dry eye syndrome. Now, investigation uh, we have a clinical and radiological investigation, which we usually carry out in our patients. Now, best side, one can do a syringe and probing. This is known to be helpful in patients, children, as sometimes it acts as a form of therapeutic treatment, particularly those uh, about 12 to 18 months, because it helps to open up the airways, which did not uh, open up the lacrimal apparatus, which did not uh, uh, canalize at that. Now, what we do is that we use uh, a syringe, we use normal saline, usually is the best side, and then at the point It is aspirated one uh, exceeds as the probing goes for that and subsequently like I said we put at the conductive phonics and then it's expected that uh, after two to five minutes the flow is seen is the TF, tears mixed with fluorescein is drained into the through the inferior meatus. And uh, one when one examines through the with the slit lamp with cover blue light, is, is if there is no obstruction, the dye is supposed to have disappeared. But where there is obstruction, there will be a high tear film, and then the um, the tears will be seen with the cover blue light. Now, Jones dye tests one and two have been used in the past. It is a form of dye disappearance test. And what happens in Jones one is that you want to find out if there is an obstruction. In Jones two, you try to determine the level of obstruction. So what you do in Jones one is uh, you try to do, you try to put a strip of fluorescein mixed with an itocaine into the entire phonics, and then put uh, a, 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 a cotton wool, most thing is amitokin into the nostrils. And then when you put that, you hope to have, you hope to have the cotton wool stained after three to five minutes by the dye. And where this does not happen, then it is believed that there is an obstruction along the tracks. Now,
intent, if the canola does not go through the horizontal uh, canalicula, it means that there may be an obstruction at the level of the horizontal canalicula. And if there is reflux uh, of the of the if there is reflux of the fluid to the superior pontum, it means that there is an obstruction probably at the sac. And then if there is a reflux to the superior pontum as well with the distension at the uh, side of the nose, it means most likely the reflux is at the obstruction is at the level of the orbital of the nasolacrima dot because the sac is extended. Now radiologically, um, there are there are some tests that can be done. X-rays in which a dacrocystography dacro has been done, in which a contrast is used. Now, uh, and, then and then the outline of the lacrimal passages is uh, taken when X-rays are done. Now, dacrocystography is also used. Uh, radionucleotide isotope is used to follow the tear uh, flow. And however, it's worthy to know that most of the X-rays and the scintigraphy are now being updated because most people would prefer the use of CT scan and MRI, which you can use with contrast studies. And um, the CT scan will show you both more bony outline and we are, if there are, mal if there are bony affectation of the lacrimal passages and the surrounding nasal uh, Nasal cavity, same with MRI, which will also show the soft tissue. One imperative study, one imperative uh, investigation one has to do is, is, is nasal endoscopy to look at the nature of the of the nostrils and how it tends to affect the the passages. Now, for treatment, uh, in it's been shown that for infants that present early, we can do a gray glass massage, okay, which is placing a firm pressure at the uh, pontum, inferior pontum, through the ally of the nose down to the inferior hiatus, which is like massaging through the muscle dot, the landmark I gave earlier. Now, it's expected that uh, 10 strokes should be done four times a day at each time, 10 strokes at each time, four times a day. It helps to recanalize the passage, we thought. And that helps, particularly in infants and uh, toddlers. Now, so engine approach, I like said earlier, can help to, can help <coughs> in children as an investigation, as a form of treatment. There has also been, uh, for partial obstructions, uh, intubation with stents has also been done to balloon the areas of partial obstruction. After the, uh, the tubes are inserted, some people use silicon, most people use silicon tube, but some people have also been uh, used uh, a Foley's catheter, that small Foley's catheter has also been used for such procedure. Now, the definitive treatment for nasal lacrimal obstruction is a dacrocystal rhinostomy. And then there is a sternal and in Indonesia. From studies done before, a National Eye Center will do external DCR. But studies have been done to show that external DCR is known to be more effective than endolaser, even though endolaser is more cosmetically acceptable by most people. By most people. So the chance between cosmesis and uh, outcome lies after discussion with the patient. Now, the external DCR, which we do in National Eye Center, now the surgeries mostly are done under general anesthesia and Crawford silicon tube is inserted. Now, we do a curved skin incision of about one to 10 millimeter, which is made medial to the angular vein. This is to avoid bleeding at the, uh, <coughs> and at the level of the medial canter, media canters. Now, this the incision is further dissected down to the periosteum and the osteostomy size of about 15 to 10 mm is made with a kerosene bone punch. Now, subsequently, we divide the lacrimal mucosa sac 
uh, into the anterior and posterior flaps, usually in an H-shaped form. And uh, we now insert the uh, tube and subsequently suture the anterior flaps, which is anastomosis with five pole bike suture. Now we do a subcutaneous suture to anchor the scent when it is necessary. Now the skin is then closed with a six o vicryl or five o silk according to availability of the suture. The nostrils subsequently are packed with four percent xylocaine mixed with one in one thousand adrenaline guns. Now post op, what we do is that we do we use a, a floxacin uh, cut four times a day and up for a phenical noctil for 10 to 14 days. Now, on the first day post up, we do a pseudoephedrine uh, nasal spray for, to prevent edema of the nostrils. Now, tabs, ciprofloxacin and diclofenac for analgesia is given. Uh, ciprofloxacin to prevent infection if there is any. We leave the silicon tube for 10 to 16 weeks. And before we remove it, we check for the patency of the ostium. And then if there is resolution of the epiphora, um, possible discharge before removal. Now we, pre we advise the patients to stop blowing the nose for about, if as much as possible, for three to four weeks. And this helps to prevent subcutaneous emphysema. Luckily, we've not seen anyone in National Eye Center. And then the skin switchers are removed after the five to six days. And uh, in National Eye Center, we notice we have a 96% success rate, which is uh, seen as a resolution of epiphora and discharge at six months. Uh, I'll share the slide with us. So these are the outcome of what we had in National Eye Center over a 10-year period. Uh, we realized that uh, the resolution of epiphora at one day post stop was in 30% of the patients uh, didn't resolve. Then it subsequently decreased to 22 patients and 10 patients at one month. At three months, uh, six patients uh, had that switch, and subsequently at six months, it was five patients. We realized that the difference between the third month and the sixth month was not statistically significant. So in future, we may be proposing discharge at uh, three months. Now, the complications we had in National Eye Center following external DCR, we had uh, most of the patients for, of the people that had failed, or the people that had complication, about 42% of them had nasal edema at the one post. I don't know where I lost stuff, but these are references. This is appreciation goes to the oculoplastic team of the National Eye Center Academia. And then we love to thank everybody. Your comments and questions are welcome. And then these are an assignments for the residents. Thank you, everyone.
So the floor is now open for questions and comments. If there are any, So I think some of the participants cannot see the questions. They are not aware that there's an ongoing chat. Which, uh, hello, battery. Hello, sir. Is a slide showing for the question, the part one and part two? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So I guess some people joined later. Thank you, Dr. Chimiozi, for the lecture. There are some questions on the chat. I'm responding to them. Okay, I thought you would explain. Okay. Yeah, so oh. that we can all hear the answer. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether. Okay, one is saying, I'm looking at, uh, one is saying, how can pump failure be differentiated from uh, hypersecretion? <coughs> uh, actually not for this but Pump failure is usually as a result of the orbicularis, and it could be nervous or mechanical. Okay, so we are looking at the neuromuscular, uh, neuromuscular damage, if there is any, which the orbicularis uh, must initiates. Now, from hypersecretion, usually there is an offending agent that uh, causes that. It could be from a irritation of the, from a an entropion, and it could also be from irritation from a chemical, not chemical, from a chemical or foreign body, as the case may be. So, for you to uh, differentiate that, really, one needs to know is basically from history taken, and then examination 
that's the majority of the thing. But for a clinical test to determine that one has to actually